Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is, happy whatever day it is. Welcome to episode 94 of Left Side of the Aisle. Um, I'm your host, I'm Larry Erickson, and for about a half an hour or so, I'm going to be ranting at you about things important to me, I think deserve your attention. If you have any reactions to the show, send them to me directly. It's whoviating, W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G at AOL.com. Uh, if you didn't catch that, my website, Lotus Surviving a Dark Time, they will be visible on the screen a couple of times, and uh, you can get the email address from there. Uh, I just ask that if you send me email, um, to please include something like Left Side of the Aisle, your cable show, or something like that in the subject line so I know it's not spam. Okay, now, I uh, went through that kind of fast because I got a lot of stuff today. I'm going to try to get it all in. First thing is that, as always, I like to start when the occasion allows for, with some good news. In fact, I got two bits of good news here. First one is that I keep telling you that this is, this, this is actually one area where most of the good news today uh, from where it seems to come, and that's the area of same-sex marriage. There's actually two bits of news on the international front on that. Uh, the first one is that on February 2nd, the, uh, the French Parliament adopted the main clause of a bill that would allow for same-sex marriage in France and for same-sex couples to adopt children. The vote was 249 to 97. There's still a lot of debate uh, coming up. Uh, there's something over 5,000 amendments that have been proposed and they expect the debate to take two weeks, but that core provision has been approved. And public support for this actually has been increasing in France. As of the end of January, according to one poll, it was 63% of the public approved of this bill. Meanwhile, at the other end of the channel, over in Britain, we've got the second item on this. On February 5th, this was, the British House of Commons voted 400 to 175 to approve a bill allowing for same-sex marriage in England and Wales. Now, what's significant here is that the bill had overwhelming support from the members of the Labour Party in the chamber, but it also had the backing of Prime Minister David Cameron, who's of the Conservative Party, and when the vote came up, about half of the Conservative Party voted for the bill. Now, th this may well have passed without Conservative support, uh, so the level of the support among Conservatives is actually significant because, well, either they did it out of conviction, or knowing the bill was going to pass and they couldn't stop it, they decided they didn't want to be seen as being on the wrong side of history. Doesn't matter which, because both of those tell the same story about change. Uh, here at home, there's something. There's a uh, new movement to press for same-sex rights across the South, which has been regarded as unwinnable. It's called the We Do campaign, and its first action was for uh, same-sex couples to apply for marriage licenses in seven southern states. Now, they knew they were going to be turned down, but that wasn't the point. The point was to raise the issue, to start the discussion. Now, it's going to take some time because opposition to same-sex marriage is higher in the South than in any other region of the country. In fact, according to the Pew Research Center, uh, the, uh, the central southern states, about 56% of the people there oppose same-sex marriage, as opposed to only 29% here in the Northeast. However, note this and note this well. That level of opposition to same-sex marriage in the Deep South is the same level as was in the entire country just 10 years ago. Change is coming. The time is coming. We just have to survive global warming and economic dismemberment long enough for it to get here. All right, second bit of good news. This has to do with the fact that the moves to overturn Citizens United have taken a concrete legal form. Now, Citizens United is that despicable Supreme Court decision that found that corporations are people with free speech rights to unlimited campaign contributions. Ever since the original decision, people have been considering various ways to overturn it or at least to limit the impact. Well, Representative Jim McGovern of Massachusetts, he's introduced into the House of Representatives two proposed constitutional amendments to do just that. And by the way, very cleverly, his office did not simply issue a press release. It posted them on Reddit, and they immediately got lots and lots of response. Now, the first proposal 
deals with campaign finance reform. It does it by saying uh, that, uh, sp explicitly stating that Congress and the individual states, I'm quoting, shall have power to regulate the raising and spending of money and in-kind equivalents in their respective elections. This would enable passage of campaign finance laws that even this court could not declare unconstitutional. The second proposed amendment, though, to my mind, is the more important one. It would overturn Citizens United outright, but it would do it by openly declaring that the rights protected by the Constitution are for actual people, and that Again, quoting the proposal, the words people, person, or citizen, as used in this Constitution, do not include corporations, limited liability companies, or other corporate entities. In other words, it would specifically reject the bizarre notion that, um, well, as Witless Romney, uh, Romney infam infamously put it, corporations are people, my friend. Now, actually, this is kind of good bad news because the prospects for this bill, for these bills, I should say, are not good. Um, the goppers in the House, especially the leadership, they love them some, some corporate cash. And they're not about to be interested in anything that would change that. That's why other efforts, like there are similar things uh, uh, for similar purpose introduced in the last Congress, and they went to the House Judiciary Committee where they went into the black hole never to be seen again. Now what's worse though is that top Democrats also appear to be embracing this idea of I love some corporate cash. Uh, there is mounting evidence that both the Obama campaign and a prospective Hillary Clinton campaign may be actually embracing the massive influx of untraceable corporate money that Citizens United allowed for. So, but it is still at the bottom line, it is still good news that at least some people have not given up on the idea of bringing at least some minimal honesty to our corporate uh, campaign financing. All right, on to something else. On to something else. Um, I, was, I was just talking about Citizens United, which, by the way, we often forget that's a group. It's an organization. But uh, Citizens United, and I was also talking about same-sex marriage. So here's an, here's an area where they kind of cross. There's a suit, uh, a case rather, before the Supreme Court about the Federal Defense of Marriage Act, or DOMA, which is pronounced DOMA, that law limits the definition of marriage to one man and one woman for all federal purposes, including federal benefits. Well, Citizens United has filed an amicus brief, a friend of the court brief, uh, in support of DOMA, saying that, no, 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 this law is constitutional. It is a valid law. You know, well, whatever. The point here, what's important is not that claim. It's the basis for the claim. Um, it's an illustration. This case is an illustration of how the right wing will openly, unhesitatingly uh, embrace the most wild-eyed, radical, bizarro world propositions for the purpose of making those wild-eyed, radical, bizarro world propositions seem not as bad, not as vicious or destructive or, or as radical as they actually are, um, if only by making them more familiar. They don't seem strange anymore. Uh, this is something actually that we on the left need to be aware of. We need to pay attention to this kind of thing. Because all right, what's the group arguing? What's Citizens United arguing? Quoting the brief. It is past time for this court to bring an end to this to the line of atextual cases begun with Bowling v. Sharp in 1954 and to place itself back under the authority of the Constitution as it is written. Bowling v. Sharp is a landmark civil rights case. The decision was handed down the same day as the better known Brown v. Board of Education. Now, Brown cited the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment in finding that separate but equal in public education was inherently unequal. Bowling was about discrimination in Washington, D.C. schools. There, the court relied on the due process, uh, uh, due process Clause of the Fifth Amendment. It found that, I'm quoting the, the, quoting the decision, the Fifth Amendment does not contain an equal protection clause as does the Fourteenth Amendment, which applies only to the states. Uh, but the concept of equal protection and due process are not mutually exclusive. Uh, 
because, the court said, quoting again, it would be unthinkable that the same constitution would impose a lesser duty on the federal government to not discriminate than it does on the individual states. Well, Citizens United declares this a judicial fiction and a mythical component of the Fifth Amendment. So what it's arguing, in fact, if, when you really talk about this, what it's really arguing is that the Constitution provides no protection for anyone against discrimination by the federal government. The states, yes. The federal government, no. The feds are free to discriminate against anyone. Blacks, Latinos, women, uh, Arabs, anyone. Uh, especially, it seems, gays and lesbians who want to marry the people they love. Um, so, what about this particular case? What's, what's Citizens United saying about the case? Well, Citizens United uh, is arguing, and I'm quoting, that by secularizing marriage, the Court of Appeals in this case, the lower court which found DOMA unconstitutional, I'm quoting here, has disregarded the historical interrelationship between biblical Christianity and the American Constitutional Republic. Indeed, the courts give no regard whatsoever to the originator and definer of marriage who created us male and female, see Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 to 28, remember I'm quoting, and enabled male and female couples to procreate offspring in his image, see Genesis chapter 5, verses 1 to 3, unquote. In other words, they're arguing biblical Christianity is the basis of American government. So much for separation of church and state. So much for freedom of religion. It's all biblical Christianity. So apparently we can add Jews, Muslims, Hindus, Buddhists, and any other non-Christian to the list of people against whom the government can freely discriminate. Oh, and atheists, especially atheists. Here's the point, though. Here's the point. One commentator called this uh, one of the more hilarious briefings I've had the pleasure to derisively laugh at. But that misses the point. I don't think that Citizens United is expecting to win its argument here. I really don't. The point now is not to win it, it's to raise it, to make it a topic of conversation, to legitimize it, if only by familiarity, to make it into something worthy of serious consideration by the very serious people in the media and inside the Beltway. It's just another example, another case, another item in this long list of items that make up this lesson, this for, which for decades I have been frustrated by this. It is a lesson the left refuses to learn. The right thinks long term. They think strategically. And one of the reasons we keep getting rolled is that we refuse to recognize that. All right, on to one of our regular weekly features, the, uh, the Clown Award, given for meritorious stupidity. All right, this week I can't give you the actual name of our winner of the red nose because this guy, his, his name has not been uh, released or, or it's unknown. But I can tell you he was from Jackson, Tennessee, and he was the owner of this dog, a male pit bull American bulldog mix. It seems that our unnamed and no doubt thoroughly macho man saw the dog humping another male dog. Now, that's actually normal canine behavior. Usually it expresses dominance, but it can also be done out of nervousness or excitement. It can be done just as, as, as play. Um, but oh no no to our highly evolved Tennessean, oh no no no, it meant his dog was gay. And he just couldn't have that. So on January 29th, he turned his dog over to the Jackson Rabies Control Animal Shelter. This is a high kill shelter to be killed. Well, happily, this pup was saved literally a few hours before it was going to be killed. It was taken by a woman affiliated with an animal rescue group. And after neutering, a health check, and a temperament check, he's going to be placed with some suitable family. Now, by the way, let it, let it be said, let it be said right here, it's possible the dog is gay. It is, it's possible. Homosexual behavior has been observed in over a thousand animal species, including dogs. And in fact, in a number of mammal species, including giraffes, dolphins, and bonobos, there has been observations of them gauging in homosexual sex just for the fun of it. So it is possible the dog was gay.
But that doesn't change the fact that whoever this guy in Tennessee is, he's a homophobe. He's a bigot, he's utterly ignorant of canine behavior, and he's a complete, thoroughgoing clown. Our other regular weekly feature, the Outrage of the Week. Uh, now, you may very likely have heard about this, I mean, it's been all over everywhere, but um, there are so many ways to be outraged by it that it's, it's worth going over. See, there is this woman, she was at a party of five adults and five children at an Applebee's recently. And as is becoming increasingly common in restaurants, when they're dealing with large groups, they added a tip of 18% to the bill. Well, this woman, who's a storefront minister, she was irritated by that. So she scratched out that, changed the tip to zero, and wrote on the receipt, I give God 10%, why should you get 18? In other words, she stiffed the waitress. Well, another waitress on duty at the time, whose name was Chelsea, she saw the note, thought it both insulting and comical, and posted it to Reddit. Now, the image went viral. Uh, and while the customer's name was not easy to read, it was legible and people were able to make out, figure out who this person was. The minister heard about this, called the restaurant, and demanded everyone on duty, staff and managers, the night that she was there, be fired. Well, Applebee's stood strong in the face of this over-the-top demand and only fired Chelsea. Applebee's management justified the decision on the grounds that, quoting, our guests' personal information, including their meal check, is private, and neither Applebee's nor its franchisees have a right to share this information publicly. Okay, the first reason to be outraged by this is this minister who went around the bend on this. I mean, what happened to forgiveness and love thy neighbor and all that stuff? Uh, but she went around the bend on this, and she's now coming on like she is the victim here. She's saying that, oh, her reputation has been ruined. She's crying about it. She's heartbroken over the whole thing and about how what she did has been blown out of all proportion, which is rich coming from somebody who wanted everybody in sight to be fired. She also says that this was just a single lapse in her usual, we're apparently supposed to accept, high ethical standards. All of which will be a little more convincing if she ever said they should hire the Chelsea back. Another outrage is how much of the coverage that was devoted to this was about how Applebee's was dealing with the PR disaster. It was as if the most important thing here was not any of the people involved, it was the effect on Applebee's corporate image. Third outrage is the corporate hypocrisy. Now remember, Chelsea was fired, supposedly, for violating the customer's privacy by having their name be legible in the image. Meanwhile, this fawning note, full of praise for Applebee's, and with a clearly legible customer signature, was posted on the company's website. When this was pointed out, the company took the image down, kind of like, what image? I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> Too late, guys. Finally, the real outrage here. The real out outrage here is that in all the coverage and all the buzz and discussion, uh, the person for whom the least concern has been shown is Chelsea. The only one here who suffered anything more than some embarrassment has been the person getting the least amount of sympathetic coverage. Uh, not, no, not in sections of the internet, mind you. There's actually an online petition for her to be rehired, and there's a Facebook page now devoted to boycotting Applebee's. I'm talking about the more mainstream media. There, she just appears as the person who, who, who published the, uh, the image uh, and then disappears again, just like she was disappeared from Applebee's. Uh, which means, ultimately, that this tale is just another tale of media misdirection and corporate callousness, which is not new, but it is still an outrage. All right, last for the show guns. Again, we're going to talk about guns. We're going to talk some about guns every week now for a while. One of the more offensive and, and probably the most quoted part uh, of the Supreme Court decision in District of Columbia v. Heller. This is a decision that um, threw out D.C.'s handgun control law. Uh, the most quoted part was that this was the first time that the court had found an individual as opposed to a collective right to guns. But in what I think is an even more important part and a more offensive part, 
The court found that a purpose of the Second Amendment was to allow for an individual right to self-defense. Now remember, this is what the amendment says. This is what the amendment says. You know, a, a well-regulated militia being a service defense of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms should not be infringed. Okay? That's what it says. But the reactionary majority on this court found, ruled, discovered, decided that one purpose of the Second Amendment was to enable you as an individual to have a gun to protect your particular family, your particular home. This was created out of whole cloth. There is nothing in the text of the amendment. There is nothing in the history of the debate on the amendment. There is no judicial precedent for any of this. They created it out of thin air. They made it up. But that is the argument now. That's the argument. Guns are all about self-defense. Self-defense. As NRA uh, Executive Vice President Wayne La Pipi Le Pew said, uh, the only thing that stops a good guy with a gun, a bad guy with a gun rather, is a good guy with a gun. All right, so how true is that? How really effective are guns at self-defense? That's what we're going to talk about today. Because the answer ultimately is they're not very good at all, and guns do not make you safe. Period. I mean, how many times do we have to prove this? How many times do we have to prove this? Here's a series of studies. Every one of these studies I'm going to tell you about was published in a peer-reviewed professional journal. Okay? 2000, from the Journal of Trauma, across high-income nations, more guns equals more gun homicides. And that was true even if the U.S. was excluded from the list. 2002, the American Journal of Public Health, across U.S. states, the same. For every age group, more guns equals more homicides, even after controlling for poverty and population density. Those same researchers repeated their work a few years later using later data and controlling for rates of aggravated assault, robbery, unemployment, urbanization, alcohol consumption, and poverty. That one was published in Social Science and Medicine in 2000, 2007, rather, and the results were the same. More guns means more gun murders. In 2004, in Aggression and Violent Behavior, a review of the literature showed that, quoting, case control studies, ecological time series, and cross-sectional studies, these are all methodological methods, indicate that in home cities, states, and regions in the U.S. where there are more guns, both men and women are at higher risk of homicide, particularly firearm homicide. Also in 2004, in the American Journal of Epidemiology, overall, having a gun inside the home triples the likelihood of being killed with a gun, quintuples the, 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 uh, the risk of committing suicide with a gun. And this was true regardless of storage practice, type of gun, or number of firearms. Again, the more guns, the more death. A 2009 study at the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine found that individuals in possession of a gun who owned a gun were four and a half times more likely to be shot in the course of an assault than people who were not carrying guns. Among uh, gun, gun owners or gun holders who actually had a chance to defend themselves during the course of this assault, they were five and a half times more likely to be shot. In 2011, a study published in the American Journal of Lifestyle, Lifestyle Medicine looked at previous research on guns. It's what's called the Meta Study. It considered both risks of having a gun in the house, including accident, suicide, homicide, and intimidation, and any possible benefits, including deterrence and self-defense. It found that homes with guns were not safer than guns without them, and in fact, if the homes had children or women, it was more of a risk to have guns, and in any event, the risks greatly outweighed the potential benefits. And finally, just this past October, there was a report by researchers at the John Hopkins, uh, John Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. It found, among other things, that right-to-carry laws do not reduce violent crime, but they are associated with an up to 9% increase in aggravated assaults. It also found that the homicide rate in the United States is seven times the average of other high-income nations because our gun homicide rate is 22 times that average. Oh, 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 but the cry rises. Uh, what about the good guy with the gun stopping the bad guy with the gun? What, you want us to be defenseless? Frankly, the idea that some gun-wielding gun hero is going to swoop in like 
Spider-Man or something and, and whip out their trusty Beretta and take down the bad guy just before he was about to murder the defenseless unarmed populace is it's a complete fantasy. It's delusional. But, oh, no, no, the manhood, uh, the manhood challenged legions will come back at you. What about the two and a half million people, two and a half million cases where people use, uh, use themselves, use guns to defend themselves against criminals every year, single year? What about that? Now, this number, which you hear about because it's promoted by the right wing and the acolytes of the death lobby, uh, it actually comes from a deeply flawed 1990s study by two criminologists. It was based entirely on self-reported claims with uh, no way to determine if the claims are true or not. It's been widely discredited. Not only were there problems with methodology and some of the results wildly, uh, wildly irrational, but a study published in 2000 in the journal Injury Prevention found not only that guns are used to threaten and intimidate far more often than they are to defend, but that most of these reported self-defense cases may in fact not have been self-defense and they may in fact have been illegal. And around the same time as that 1990 study, a survey was done by the Department of Justice, which found that the number of defensive uses of guns at about 108,000 annually, about 4% of what the right-wingers are claiming, and a figure which significantly includes police using their weapons in the line of duty. All right, but just how delusional this idea of the, of the civilian savior is, there was an experiment ABC News did in 2009 in cooperation with the police department of Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. It sought to test the ability of ordinary people without specialized crisis training to protect themselves with a gun in a moment of stress. Without going into the details, and you can find a link to the video at my website, without going into the details, the results were repeated failures. In this test situation, not one of these subjects was able to effectively defend themselves with a gun. Life is not like a video game, and as much as we all like to imagine ourselves turning into Bruce Willis and Die Hard at such a moment, life is not like a movie either. Because as, as a salon political, report, a salon political reporter, I'm getting ahead of myself, Alex Seitz Wald wrote recently, quoting him, the truth is that it's extremely difficult for anyone, let alone a lightly trained and inexperienced civilian to effectively respond to a shooter. The entire episode could take a matter of seconds and your body is fighting against you. Under extreme stress, reaction time slows, heart rate increases, fine motor skills deteriorate. Police train to build muscle memory to overcome that reaction but the training wears off if you don't keep it up every several months. I mean, even trained cops can have trouble. A RAND study of the New York Police Department in 2008 found that officers involved in gunfights typically hit their intended targets only 18% out of the time. They miss four times out of five. In most cases, uh, the cops involved in the shooting suffered uh, sensory distortions, including tunnel vision and um, loss of hearing. Afterwards, they sometimes were surprised to learn that they'd fired their guns at all. That also helps to give the lie to the notion that more armed guards in schools is the answer, uh, at least to school shootings. I mean, consider though, Columbine had an armed guard. Taft Union High School in Taft, California, where a shooting took place a couple of weeks ago, has an armed guard. Virginia Tech has a whole police department. There was an armed guard at Lone Star College where there was a shooting two weeks ago. Fort Hood is a military base, for pity's sake. And then again, not all mass shootings take, pl take place at schools. Do, uh, are we supposed to have an armed guard at every mall, every movie theater, every house of worship, every health center? And virtually all shootings are not mass shootings, they're individual shootings. Do we have to have armed guards in every bus, every train, in every doctor's office, in every apartment building, every office building, on every corner? How far do we want to go with this? The fact is, difficult though it may be to admit, sometimes it is impossible to stop a shooter no matter how many guns are around. As Seitzwald pointed out, John Hinckley was able to nearly kill Ronald Reagan and, and um, permanently disable James Brady despite their being surrounded by dozens of heavily armed and highly trained people. Our safety does not lie in guns. Our safety lies in the absence of guns. And the best way to ensure that absence is to make guns as hard as possible to get. That's it for this week. You have the best week you can. We'll see you next week.